Welcome to the third part of this GNU Radio tutorial series. First we're going to look at using the UDP source block to receive baseband samples across a network. On the other side of the network we have HDSDR connected to a USRP via the XIO plugin. This has the UDP relay feature enabled and that's going to send through the baseband stream of the network to this flow graph here. We've set particular parameters like the port to listen on and the payload size to expect. But the other thing we need to consider is the types of the data flowing through the flow graph. Here we have a number of blocks that are expecting to see floating point complex samples, but the UDP source is currently configured to output the type short, which is a 16-bit signed integer. There's an important thing to note about the use of types. At the lowest level in GNU Radio, there is no notion of types. The runtime effectively moves around blocks of memory which contains what we would identify as samples in some particular format. Types only first appear when you start casting that memory to particular types of pointers at the C++ level and it's at that code level that the block needs to be aware of the type of the data that's actually being used so the idea is to cast it to the correct type if you were say casting a block of memory that contains floating point samples and you casted it to a pointer to 16-bit signed integers then you would get garbage. At this level though in the environment when we talk about types it's purely in the form of connecting up blocks and validating that we are in fact making sense. So it's just a notional type. As we've selected a short output we get this color and to get it to the floating point complex samples, we can use the I short to complex. If you consider how the baseband samples are being transmitted over the network via Bore IP from the XTIO plugin, they are an interleaved sequence of shorts. They're interleaved samples of I and Q, the real and complex components of a complex sample. So the I short to complex block is a very simple way of converting such an interleaved short stream to a complex sample. We can also introduce the concept of vectors here because many blocks have this vec length property and by default it's set to 1 which means that notionally it's just going to output a sequence of whatever type is selected and it, that sequence will just contain individual units of that one sample. If we were to change this to two, this aligns with the fact that we're transmitting pairs of shorts. Each pair has two components, as I mentioned before, the real and complex components. So if we made that two, you see now that the color has changed on the output port. And this connection has become invalid because we're trying to connect a vector type into a non-vector type what we can do is we can delete that connection and use this vector to stream block. What this is going to do is it's going to accept a vector where the vector is of length 2 and it'll unpack that into a sequential stream of samples. Now remember once again that this is just the notional form of a vector at this high level. Underneath in the runtime we're still moving around blocks of memory and if you were to look at those samples where they sit in memory, they would still look like a sequential stream, even though we may call them a vector of 2 or a vector of 16 or what have you. So this is just a good way of organizing at this high level how you're going to deal with types. So we'll leave this because both methods will work equally. And we'll now look at the frequency translating FIR filter. This is a very handy block because it allows you to narrow down on a signal of interest in the broader band baseband stream. Before we delve into the properties, let's consider the rate at which samples will be coming into this flow graph. As I mentioned, we have a USRP connected to the transmitter on another computer. I've set that to have a sample rate of 1 mega samples per second, which means we're going to have a 1 megahertz wide baseband stream coming in. The ADC rate of the USRP is generally 64 megahertz. That's the frequency of the onboard clock. The decimation rate in use is 64, 
and the SAMP rate is actually calculated through evaluating this little equation here. So it's just ADC rate divided by the decimation, and we get one mega samples per second. The FIR filter here is going to decimate by four, so it'll output a stream with a rate of 250 kilo samples per second, or 250 kilohertz wide bandwidth. The idea though is that apart from setting the input sample rate and the decimation, you also set the center frequency. So it's going to move the spectrum along so that your signal of interest at that center frequency is now centered at zero hertz on the output spectrum. This is very handy when you then pass it in to be demodulated later on. Also, you need to provide these taps for the filter. This is one convenient way of doing it. Commonly you'd pass in a low pass filter and this is actually a function in the FIR design module. It takes a number of arguments but the relevant ones are the incoming sample rate, the bandwidth of this filter and the transition width. As you can see this is actually a variable here, the bandwidth, and we can change that at runtime using a slider. Now the output of this FIR filter proceeds into these GUI elements that allow us to visualize various aspects of the signal. But before I delve into each of those, I just wanted to point out two other things. Firstly, we have an XML RPC server block here. This is a very powerful block that allows you to change aspects of this flow graph at runtime. So you can send XML RPC requests and it will then interpret those requests and change the values of variables within your flow graph so you can control them over the network. And this is how you can change the translation offset, as you can see these are variables here as well, from HDR, SDR for instance using the XO plugin by clicking at points on the receive spectrum and then it'll tune this translation to the signal that you clicked on in the uh, application running on another computer. The second point is about persisting the values of variables between runs of a flow graph. You can accomplish this using the variable config block and usually you link that with another variable. So let's take this example here. We've got config xlate offset. That's the idea of this config block. And that's going to relate to this xlate offset text box which contains the translation offset. Now if we open up the properties here, the default value takes on the value provided by the config block. This is why we use the ID here. However, the config block contains some important properties too. Firstly, here we have the configuration file name, the section within that, and the name of the option. These are both strings. The value that will be written back into the file will be this value here, and we relate back to the variable text box by its ID. So when we load the flow graph, this will read in the value in the file and the text box will assume that value. When we shut down the flow graph, the config will take that value from the text box and save it back to the file. Let's have a look now at where we're sending our baseband signal. We have the fast autocorrelation sync. This will show us properties in the file, uh, in the incoming stream related to periodicity or periodic repeating patterns within the baseband stream. We've got the fast Fourier transform sync, scope sync, the waterfall so we can see the fast Fourier transform over time. We have a constellation sync which won't exactly be useful here because we won't be listening to a phase shift keyed signal. But the important point is once you know the parameters of the modulation, particularly the symbol rate, it's always handy to have your stream coming in at a multiple of that rate. And if your incoming stream is not at a multiple of that rate, you can use a resampler, such as the rational resampler or one of the other ones, to alter the sample rate to become a multiple. That means this, this will lock on a little better. The easy way of doing that with the rational resampler is just to put the incoming rate into the decimation, the required rate in the interpolation, and it will calculate the greatest common divisor. Finally, we have the scope sync, but this is a slightly different than the one above because it accepts a real floating point input. We use the quadrature demodulator, which is a wonderfully simple and 
powerful block that's used to demodulate FM and it takes complex signal and internally what it does is multiply the current complex sample by the complex conjugate of the previous one and then find the angle or the argument of the resulting complex number and that's essentially what a demodulated FM signal is without filtering of course so bear that in mind when we look at the signal now I'm going to enable the UDP relay on the other computer so I've got samples coming in and I'll execute this flow graph and I will now send a tuning command so watch the translation offset that's changed now and you see that we have narrowed in on this particular signal let's have a listen to this signal after putting it through an FMD modulator so that sounds a lot like a Motorola Type 2 trunking control channel for analog voice the bandwidth as I mentioned we can alter runtime too so every time I move the slider it's going to call that low pass function and calculate new taps and therefore change the bandwidth of the signal of course if we auto scale you can see that the signal drops down a lot further and as we change the bandwidth it rises up so it's not like it disappears completely it's just several orders of magnitude uh, down let's now look at the scope plot we can see the real and imaginary parts of the complex samples coming in there definitely appears to be some sort of modulation or data there if we look at the constellation plot we get a circle this is significant but I'll discuss that a little later let's look at the waterfall I usually like to go to RGB2 and auto scale you can see that there are almost two distinct levels appearing there the carrier frequency would be in the middle but we have two distinct deviations either side so we might be looking at a two level frequency shift keyed signal which we can do interesting things with once we put it through an FM demodulator like the quadrature demodulator block let's look at the output of that if we zoom out a little bit the signal looks a little bit noisy and that is because our bandwidth is still quite wide here remember that the signal exists and it's just been attenuated by that low pass filter so we're going to narrow the bandwidth of that now just to narrow right in on our signal of interest let's look at the output of the demodulator again that looks a lot better and you can clearly see a data stream here looks like there are two levels so it's a binary stream 2FSK and it's ripe for slicing so all you need to do is essentially set up a slicer and then sample at the appropriate points in time and you will get your binary data stream remember that I was saying that the output of the quadrature demodulator block is in fact an angle this is what we're graphing here so this is, these are deviations from the carrier frequency and because it's 2FSK we've got two different frequencies and they're resulting in these two levels of deviation the spikes we see here are due to noise in the input signal and when that noise reaches the quadrature demodulator the internal arc tangent function which will calculate the angle of the computed vector on the complex plane will output deviations or values that exceed the two standard levels of this digital 2FSK format if we zoom out those values would vary between positive and negative pi or 3.14 since we're operating in radians let's now look at the fast auto correlation sync we should see peaks coming up here if there are any repeating components to this signal this is a control channel so it will transmit bits and pieces to various radios regarding the state of the network but during the rest of the time the idle time it should just be continuously repeating information about the station and we seem to have some peaks coming up here they're not incredibly strong but um, that certainly would warrant further investigation looks like we have some strong ones appearing now back to this circle as I said this is not phase shift keying we're actually looking at FM but the fact that we have a circle here even though it's not synchronized to a signal is a 
good indicator that we quite possibly might be listening to FM and we can confirm that by putting this into mine mode. You can see that generally because the samples, consecutive samples are forming this circle, they're placed around the circumference and so the amplitude or the magnitude of the complex samples are generally one. If we look at the demodulation here, or rather just the scope. If we put this into XY mode, then again we get a circle. And if we put that into line mode, then we see that they are forming the lines around the circumference and that the magnitude is more or less constant. And this is what you would generally expect from an FM signal due to the nature of the modulation. So that's some simple visualization you can do with these scopes.